Good morning and welcome to St Swithin's Daily Devotional. My name's Terry and I'm pleased to be with you. You know, sometimes when we read a passage from Scripture, our first response is to ask, what on earth has this got to do with me? It has nothing to do with the world in which I live. And yet so often, when we begin to examine the passage, we discover timeless truths within it. Today's passage is like that. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning at verse 14 through to chapter 11, verse 1. It would be good if you had the passage in front of you. So grab your Bibles now and open them up at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14. This passage before us has to do with the eating of food which has been offered to idols in a pagan temple. I doubt if this is a problem for any of us, in fact, but it was a very real problem for the Corinthian Christians. In fact, it was such an issue that they specifically wrote to Paul and asked him for his guidance. And so it is in chapter 8, verse 1. He says, Now about food offered to idols, and he presses on to make some comments. Chapter 9 is a bit of an aside to do with Paul's rights as an apostle. And then in chapter 10, he returns to the issue of food offers to idols. That's chapter 10, which is the passage to which we're now turning. But let us first pray. Heavenly Father, as we look at your word, help us to understand it. Although it was spoken to people long ago in a very different culture, help us to understand its timeless truths so that we may live lives that honour and glorify you. In Jesus' name, Amen. The passage before us actually reflects two social scenarios that were common in Corinth. The first was the participation in pagan festivals within the precincts of the temple. The second was participation in a meal in an unbeliever's house. Verses 14 to 22 address the first issue. Verse 14 begins with therefore, and thus it points us back to verses 1 to 13, where Paul reminds his readers of Israel's disastrous failure, historically, due to their idolatrous behaviour. It is a very serious matter. And so it is that Paul begins with an exhortation, flee from idolatry. The word flee suggests that we should be like a fugitive seeking to escape from a threatening situation. We also know from chapter 8 that the question of Christian liberty or Christian freedom also lies behind this problem. That is, Christians are not under the law but under grace and therefore they are free from rules about eating this or eating that or not eating this or not eating that and so on. This particular issue has to do with being at a pagan feast and eating a meal that's been offered to idols. Notice in these verses how often Paul uses the word participation. The point he makes is that participating in spiritual activities connects you to the spiritual reality behind them. So for example, when you participate in the bread and wine at the Lord's table, you connect spiritually with Christ. It is not simply a religious activity. And thus, if you participate in pagan feasts in the temple, while you may say as a Christian, the idols are nothing, you are actually connecting with the demonic, the reality behind the evil, the idols. So says Paul, have nothing to do with pagan feasts. You are vulnerable and Satan will seek to ensnare you. Remember, Satan is a serious enemy and he wants to bring you down. Get out of there. Now, how does this relate to us? I think it's telling us to avoid social environments, or in fact, any, any environment, that is clearly evil. Where there is overt evil, Satan is at work. Now, sadly, for example, 
I've seen a number of sexual moral failures by Christian leaders. Typically, it commences with an exciting chemistry between two people. Typically, it's followed up with innocent flirtatious behaviour. It's unwise, but not sinful. But then, if it does not stop, that situation progresses very rapidly and becomes sinful. The progression is predictable and it will end up with immoral sex and all the consequences of that sinful behaviour. And as a result, Satan has a resounding victory. So out of this problem, totally foreign to us, God says, don't get caught up in evil situations. Flee from them. Get away from them. Don't flirt with sin. Now, having dealt with the first problem, Paul turns to the question of being a guest at an unbeliever's house and being served meat. It's probably meat that's been offered to an idol. That's the case because it was a common problem. And a good deal of the meat bought through the meat market is the leftover from the temple sacrifices. A person may or may not know whether the meat comes, where the meat comes from. It's simply cooked and served to those present at the meal. What does a Christian do in these circumstances? Well, Paul's first advice is this. If nothing is said about the origin of the meat, say nothing, don't worry about it, you're free to eat, enjoy it as a provision from God. However, a far more sensitive situation may arise where a Christian present at that meal has the meat before them in the unbeliever's house and someone says, this meat was offered to an idol. We don't know why the comment is made or by whom. Is it the unbeliever being sensitive to the Christian guest? Is he hinting that he would not expect him to eat this meat? Is it the comment from another Christian there who feels conscience bound not to eat it and he's explaining his problem and frankly he's not expecting his fellow Christians to eat it either? Any Christian in that context about to eat now has a problem, an awkward situation before them. They are free to eat, but they now know that if they do, it will offend someone. Now, they can insist upon their right to eat this meat, or they may voluntarily not do so because they now know it will offend another's conscience, possibly causing them to stumble in their faith or it may confuse un unbelievers who are present and observing what's going on. Paul's principle is clear in verse 24. Nobody should seek his own good, but the good of others. Paul's concluding comments for this passage are at the end of chapter 10 to verse 11, chapter 11, 1, where he pulls the threads together and he provides three principles to guide Christians in our daily lives. Through Paul, God is giving us divine guidelines for living. Principle one, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. God's glory should shape our lives. Now that's not easy to do. It is easy to understand, but it's hard to do. As you and I go through today, we would do well to ask ourselves, what values and attitudes are determining my decisions? Do they have God's DNA upon them? Principle two, do not cause anyone to stumble by your behaviour. Try to accommodate others. Remember Paul's words in verse 24, Nobody should seek his own good, but the good of others. These days we're hearing a lot from people demanding their rights in this COVID environment. But we're not hearing so much about our responsibilities towards others or 
how to love our neighbour. How precious are we about our rights? How passionate are we about seeking the good of others? In a contest between the two, which one would win? We ought to reflect upon that today. Principle three, follow the example of Christ. Paul followed Christ and he points us to Christ. He points us to the one who left his place in glory at the Father's side and became truly human. He points us to the one who did not hold on to his glory, did not hold on to his rights, but out of love for us, he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. He sought, at great cost, our ultimate good, our salvation. So brothers and sisters, as we reflect upon this passage today, and as we live today and every day, let us, by God's grace, live lives that glorify God and lovingly serve others, following the example of Jesus, who loved us and gave himself for us. So may God bless you today and go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.